Sweet Caroline. Bo, bo, bo. <laughs> times never <laughs> feel so good. So good. So good. So good. That just made my day. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet Caroline, ba, ba, ba. good times never felt so good. Oops, oops. Welcome back, Saito, to the Sensei Says podcast. I am Sensei Pascal, back inside world renowned Saint Julie, Quebec, Canada dojo, my podcast dojo. I should say, I hope you're crushing your day. I hope you're having a, uh, an awesome week. Thank you for choosing my podcast today. And if you haven't done so already, don't forget to like this video, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel or subscribe to the podcast on whichever audio platform you are listening on at this very moment. And also don't forget to leave a comment and share to a friend. Uh, this week, uh, it's... Yeah, yeah, my jersey. I know what you're saying. What, what's the jersey you're wearing? I, my beloved Red Sox. There you go. Yeah, I know I've got the uh, Dropkick Murphy song in my head. Shipping up the busted. Whoa, whoa. I know I'm a French Canadian, obviously. <laughs> and I'm not that big of a hockey fan. How about that? I'm an anomaly. I am a huge baseball fan though, and uh, as soon as the Expos were gone, I'm still crying about it deep inside. Cross fingers, cross fingers. One day, they will be back so I can eat a hot dog with hopefully my grandchildren. <laughs> and say, I remember back in the day, Andre Dawson would catch fly balls at the center field. <laughs> Patrick, that's for you, sir. That's my homage to uh, both our uh, Red, so Red Sox uh, fandom. I hope you uh, you like it. It's my favorite jersey. Number four. Uh, 15. Sorry about that. 15. I said four because four is the position number of my favorite player, Dustin Pedroia, a small second baseman. But such a lion heart. And that's officially enough for the baseball today because I'm turning into a sports podcast and it's starting to smell like popcorn and hot dog and beer spilled all over my floor in my podcast dojo. And that is not normal. Back to our main mission. And my mission is actually my passion is to discuss with uh, inspirational people, uh, have a an uh, interesting chat with them and while I'm chatting, while I'm conversing, try to dig out some actionable advice which I'm going to apply to improve my life and hopefully uh, the same happens, the same process happens to, uh, to you too. You uh, learn some advice to uh, improve on your life as well. So this week's subject, uh, I think you're going to absolutely love the podcast. So my friend Patrick Sweeney is a extraordinaire entrepreneur or entrepreneur extraordinaire, depending if you're using the French and English or the English or French. And Patrick is also a best-selling author. His book, Fear is Fuel, available now through Amazon with the link in this uh, show's notes or video description on the YouTube. But basically, uh, Patrick has lived uh, most of his life dealing with fear uh, in such a bad way that his life uh, got turned upside down in many negative ways until uh, some drama happened. Some medical situation is going to tell you all about it in a few moments. And uh, through that uh, obstacle, very harsh obstacle, he learned to uh, confront his fears and live a fulfilling life. It is truly one of my uh, the interviews I enjoy the most doing first because Patrick is an amazing man, truly inspirational. All in all, just a really, really fun conversation I had the privilege to, uh, to have. So I'm taking you back now in Lake Tahoe, California and look at that mountain in the background. It's amazing. Anyways, this cannot go wrong. <laughs> Between two Red Sox fans, yeah, I mean, exactly. this is going to be the best interview ever. Uh, it, it is one for the ages. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But let's not mention anything from this season, though. So no, 2019 listen, doesn't exist. Listen, you have to give the other team some chances, right? It, there you it, go. You, you got to let other people win every now and then or it just doesn't get interesting. Kind of like the Patriots. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. So 2020 would be our year. Cross yeah, fingers. We hope it. so. 2020, Patriots. Bruins and Red Sox. 
Maybe Celtics. Celtics? Yeah, yeah. Have, uh, has Boston ever gone four for four? No, no, no. This this year was close with, uh, uh, or sorry, 2019 was close with the Bruins making the playoffs, making the final of the Stanley Cup as well. Uh, so that would have been, it was Red Sox, Patriots, and then the Bruins would have been the icing on the cake, but they missed it by just a bit. Yeah, Boston is my favorite city in the world. I mean, it's so beautiful. It's, it's big, but not... Too Not much. Too big. Yeah, yeah. The architecture is just wonderful, and yeah. the people are really, really nice. So, yeah, and it's great. And there's so much to do. You know, there's there's uh, the mountains, the sea. You've got museums and universities, and yeah, it's really it's a great diverse city. I like it a lot. And then at each and every eighth inning, Sweet Caroline. <laughs> Pum, 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 pum. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly right. That's it. I do the drive from Montreal to Boston just for that moment. That's it. After I'm gone. Just for Neil Diamond. I actually saw <laughs> him go. sing that. Uh, I'm trying to think what World Series it was. Maybe... Um, Uh, maybe the second one. Was it 2004? I can't remember, but I actually he's, I saw him sing that at, at Fenway. Wow. It was awesome. How was the crowd? Uh, uh, unbelievable. <laughs> off, off the charts. Off the charts. Uh, going to your uh, uh, particular subject. So you've yeah. got a peculiar relationship with fear. That's your main area of expertise. So maybe a quick story about how you came across maybe uh, fear as a quote-unquote monster in your childhood yeah so um, I started out and I had a I had a life of um, you know complete cowardice you couldn't find a wimpier guy a, a, a more scared kid than me growing up first generation Irish immigrant uh, you know family living in the blue-collar suburbs of Boston and I had a, a grandfather who used to hit me with his belt you know he was abusive and uh, I was bullied as a kid and then at uh, seven years old I saw a horrific plane crash on TV at Logan Airport in Boston 100 people died and that just planted this seed of terror in me that I became afraid of everything after that and uh, and it stuck with me for most of my life and You know, one of the funny things, Pascal, is it, it put this, you know, I started building up this armor to try and cover up my fear, right? To try and cover up my shame. Because I, I felt a shame of being afraid of everything as well. And I, I felt, you know, regret and, and, and all of that and kept trying to build up this armor and, and, you know, tried to do it with sports, tried to do it with business and nothing worked. And, and then, you know, I had this near-death experience. I won't, I won't give away the ending now, but that's, that's what changed everything. All right. So, um... I mean, I, I read some, some things about your, uh, your passé and also um, watched a lot of interviews. And one question came to my mind, is there a moment, a period of time between your childhood and the, uh, maybe the moment you just talked about, med medical-wise, that you thought about consulting uh, therapy instead of just wandering in, in some kind of A's and clouds looking for your inner self. Yeah, you, you know, uh, it's funny, at 14, um, you know, my, my parents, I think I was 14 or 15, we were living in Keene, New Hampshire, and my parents got worried enough, you know, about me and, and uh, how things were going that they took me to a therapist. And, uh, of course, I was, you know, completely embarrassed to be there, right? Didn't want anyone to know. And then I also figured I know as much or more than this therapist does. So I, <laughs> I can game him. And I did. And I just, you, you know, I, I was able to, to tell him what he wanted to hear. And, oh, and you okay. know, my parents who weren't making much money were paying, I don't know what they were paying, 50 bucks an hour or 100 bucks an hour or whatever. Uh, you know, I, I said to my, my dad, I said, you know, uh, I got it. You know, he told me some stuff. I'm good. And, <laughs> and he, uh, you know, it, it, it was, it was a shame because I wasn't at all open to the authentic me, you know, and, and that was the story of my life for the first 35 years. It was trying to cover up the shame, trying to hide the guilt and, and do it however I could. And with sports, with money, with, you know, material stuff, with intimidation, it didn't matter. So when therapy doesn't work and all maybe the, the, the masks, the costume don't work, where you go from there? What's the, uh, is it the near death experience that got you like the, the, on, on the back of the head and got you on the straight line or yeah so so that's how it happened so um you know i, I tried uh, i was second in the olympic trials uh in rowing rowing the single skull and uh i was raced the world cup for three years and i thought you know sports might might um might bring me courage you know as a national champion and won dozens and dozens of races and then at, at 
at the point I realized, you know, sports didn't do it, even though I was top in, in, the, in the world, you know, in this, in the, as a single scholar. And uh, I said, okay, well, I'll go back. I got into top five business schools, and, and I'll go back and I'll make a lot of money. And I started uh, three technology companies. And, you know, I had $150,000 cars and $20,000 watches, and I had all this armor uh, that, that I constantly was putting up against this fear. And I didn't know it at the time, you know, I, I, I didn't really know what was going on and I was afraid of the authentic me. Like if mm -hmm. right now I'm thinking, Pascal, you know, this is so awesome. I'm with you. Thank you so much. It's I love ritual. you for doing this. You know, before <laughs> I would have been, like, you know, you know, I, yeah, sure. I'll do your interview and that, that's fine. And, you know, I, and you it, feel that when you come across people oh, like that, man. you just feel it. Yeah. You know, you feel you their, know their insecurities, but, but, you know, most people don't know those insecurities or that, or that, you know, intimidation. It's all from fear. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, what I was doing, I was afraid of everything. I mean, I was terrified when I was running my businesses, um, uh, you know, I'll go back to the, the Olympic days when I found out that I could race the world cup, very few Americans have ever, you know, been able to do that. And so when I found out I should have been thrilled, but I was terrified because it meant I had to fly to Europe. So seven oh. or eight beers to drag my ass on a plane to the point where I could fly. And then, you know, what happened after that was when, when I started into business, I raised a lot of money, raised, you know, over $50 million starting these companies. And so I was always afraid the board was going to fire me and find a different CEO. My employees were going to quit. Okay. My customers were going to leave. I was so afraid of everything. I had this constant low level cortisol, like the stress hormone yeah. going through my body all the time, eating away at me like lead, you know, like, like acid le eating yeah, away at lead. And, uh, and so the way I dealt with it was drinking. I'd have, okay. I'd have seven or eight beers every night and on the weekends twice that. And so, you know, I'd be getting four or five hours of teeth grinding sleep every night, feel guilty about drinking the day before. So I'd wake up early, go to the gym to sweat it out. And that was my whole routine for like five or six years, working 80 hours a week, drinking, you know, every day, only caring about money. My goal was 40 by mm -hmm. 40. I wanted to make myself a net worth of $40 million by the time I was 40 years old fuck everything else, right? <laughs> Including my health and my family. And, <laughs> and so that it was at that point, I mean, if that sounds familiar to any of your listeners, yeah, then the same thing could happen to them. That, that's what I was going to mm -hmm. say. I mean, the discourse that you have right now, I mean, you're talking and I see people that I know, and I'm yeah. sure people watching or listening, uh, a lot of them will relate to the, I, I call that the, the living cocoon. They live, yeah, they live exactly what within it was. a cocoon, yeah. like an image of themselves that they would like to become. Yeah. That might not be they're the right one for something. them. Yeah, yeah an yeah. image, uh, uh, um, a person. Persona. Yeah, and that's exactly. completely false yeah. because they're afraid of themselves. Yeah. So uh, from your uh, trauma, you go 180. So what do you do from there? So, you, you know, what happened, like I said, if that sounds familiar, one morning I'm getting up in the gym trying to, to sweat it out like normal. My arm hurts. And I'm thinking, oh, I must have pulled a muscle or, or tendon or something. Next day, woke up. It's really hurting. And I should have gone to the doctor, but I didn't because I was afraid, yeah. right? Afraid of what it'd tell me. Looks so like the heart. <sighs> third day, yeah, it's like, you know, swollen up like a Christmas tree stocking, big and red and angry. So I went to the doctor and he said, you know, uh, it's probably just a staph infection. We see oh. that with guys who go to the gym all the time. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you some antibiotics. We'll take a blood test and the nurse will call you back this afternoon. The nurse didn't call me back. The doctor yeah, did. That and that was the yeah. one phone call that changed my life. Because he said, we don't know what it is, and we don't have the technology or the doctors to figure it out here. We're going to send you the best hospital in the world to Johns Hopkins. They'll figure it out. All right. I get to Johns Hopkins, and the doctor says to me, you know, we've got all the best technology and doctors and stuff, but let me ask you, are your affairs in order? And that's pretty Ouch. much, yeah, wow. that's, that's pretty much doctor speak for your fucked. Yeah. <laughs> you know, knock out, knock out punch You don't want right to there. hear that. My wife's six months pregnant, sitting down at the end of the bed. We all had right. a one-year-old daughter at uh, her grandparents' house. And I get this news and all I could feel was regret for the life that I didn't live. Right. I felt shame about all, all the things that I missed out on, about what kind of a husband and a parent I was and, and where my focus was and how everything was. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. And it was at that point when I decided if I get out of here, I'm going to get over this fear of flying. I'm going to get over this, this fear of everything else happening in my life. And then, you know, I later found out that we can literally flip a switch 
between fear and courage. And so it was at that, that point when I almost died and, and I had this experience one night when I decided if I get out of here, I'm going to choose courage. So from a super negative to a super constructive, so what have you constructed since that uh experience live experience so in the in the hospital you know I was using a lot of the mental techniques I learned at the Olympic Training Center to help heal my body and I got out and I said if I'm gonna get over this fear of flying I'm gonna learn how to fly a plane so I started taking <laughs> flying lessons that's so cool <laughs> yeah and so and let me tell you I peed like four times before I went out for the first one like in the second lesson I might have pooped myself just a little bit there you just, go. yeah <laughs> not too much there you go and uh, and <laughs> But the amazing thing, Pascal, is after the third or fourth flight, I fell in love with flying. And, and I got my private pilot's license. I got my instrument rating. I went on. I got my commercial pilot. I'm never going to be a commercial there pilot. And now I compete in aerobatics, like doing the absolute thing that would have fucking terrified me yeah. 15 years ago, rocketing down towards the ground, pulling five Gs alone in a plane, like would have just the idea of it would have had me screwed up in a fetal position in the corner. <laughs> and now it's one of my greatest senses of joy and fulfillment and, and happiness. So what I want to find out is why. So I started talking to all these neuroscientists and, and fear had locked away not only me seeing the whole world because I was afraid to fly, but it locked away the joy of flying for 35 years because I was afraid. And, and so I interviewed 36 neuroscientists, 500 CEOs, professional athletes, Navy SEALs, Tour de France winners, all these people to figure out how the brain works. And that's where the book Fear is Fuel, mm -hmm. which comes out in January, That's the basis of all that, and it's how anyone can take all of the components in our brain and put them to work to live a courageous life. You don't have to go through a near-death experience to change your life, because on the other side of fear is where all your dreams live. But most people are just afraid to, to, to charge at that wall, to, to try and, you know, we're at the Spartan race now, it's just like an obstacle. Yep. You know, most people see that, that giant wall, and they turn around, and they walk away. And that's what fear is to a lot of people. We become afraid of fear. It's not, it's not actually doing, getting over the wall, it's the fear of getting over the wall. And so once you do, once you attack that wall and you get to the other side, like man, it wasn't nearly as bad as I thought, and this is amazing on this side of it. So relevantly, what would be the three pieces of advice you would give someone watching who's feeling what you felt, yeah. who's like seeing him or herself within your past self. So what would be the three steps going forward from watching this interview and to a better li life? So I think number one is to scare yourself every day. There and, you go. And the reason is we need more fear in our life because most people don't know how to hear it, how to handle it. So when we get scared, this little gland in the base of our brain called the amygdala it turns on and that's our lizard brain that's part of what's called the limbic system and it handles a fight flight or freeze response and the only thing the amygdala cares about is getting our genes on to the next generation procreating the race so it, it doesn't care about your happiness it doesn't care about your success it doesn't care about your relationships or your business all it cares about is survival so when that amygdala kicks on it produces a fear cocktail Right? We start getting DHEA and adrenaline and cortisol and all these things pumping through your body. And when most people feel them, they, they, they freak out. They're like, man, I'm scared. This is, this is really messed up. I'm, I'm, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. If we scare ourselves every day and we start to learn what our body does, then we say, okay, I get it. It's, it's, it's the amygdala switching on. It's trying to take over. That's okay. I, I don't need to freak out. It's not a threat. I got a challenge coming up. And with that challenge is an opportunity. All right, so number one would be facing your fears daily. Every day. Number two if, would... If you're scared, and, and it's easy to face your fears. Like if you're scared of public speaking, go out to lunch with some coworkers and make a toast. Stand up and make a toast. There you and, go, small and, steps. Yeah, little steps like that. You don't have to jump out of a plane, right, every, <laughs> every day. Taking a cold shower. You know, I speak two or three times a month, and people ask me about my morning routine. And I always say a cold shower, and like, oh, God, there's no way I could do that. And I'm like, it's ch you're just afraid. No one's going to die from standing in a cold shower yeah. for five minutes. It's, it's just fear. Maybe you start so, with warm and go colder yeah, and colder cold day by day. Yeah, cold for the last minute, cold for the last 30 seconds or whatever. It's, it's only fear. And so, so that's the first thing is scare yourself every day. The second thing is try and step away from what's happening when it's happening and, and pretend you're, you're filming something from a helicopter. Right? All right. So if you can, if you can look like an observer 
instead of being in the situation. So my, I've got uh, two boys who are 14 and 13 who play this video, this driving video game that I'll play with them every now and then. And you can sit behind the wheel and you can drive with that perspective, right? And the, and you're the driver and and you're reacting to everything that happens, or you can be up in the helicopter and you can see the whole track and you can see the turns that are coming up and you can see the other car, that's what you want to be in life. Like when that amygdala tries to hijack, you want to step back and you want to look and say, okay, well, why, why am I feeling this fear? What's going on here that's making me have this reaction before you make a decision? Oh, there we go. Because the third part is you only make a decision two ways, either out of fear or out of opportunity. Hi. If you make a decision out of fear, it always leads to regret or shame or failure. If you make a decision out of opportunity, it always leads to growth, happiness, fulfillment, excitement. So if you get to that stage where you can recognize all these things that's happening in your body and you choose courage and you choose opportunity, and your whole life will change. And there's a lot of neuroscience and a lot of techniques and a lot of sort of homework and stuff in the book for your listeners. And, and mm -hmm. uh, like I said, that'll be out in January and you can pre-order it now, uh, you know, and get some stuff as well. So words of wisdom from the fear guru, the name of the book again? The book is called Fear is Fuel at Amazon and Barnes and Noble for pre-order. All right, yeah. and uh, starting one? Uh, January, Jan February? Jan yeah, middle, uh, beginning of January is, uh, is the release date. And before we end this, we, we, we just got to do it again. Okay. <clears throat> Sweet Caroline. Ba, ba, ba. <laughs> Times <laughs> never feel so good. So good. So good. So good. That just made my day. <laughs> <laughs> Merci bien tout le monde. Bang, bang, bang. I just can't get enough of that song. It's playing back over and over in my head again. And I'm not, I'm really not joking. When I say that's my favorite moment, uh, every time I attended a, a game at Fenway Park, I just can't not wait the eighth inning. And I guarantee you, if you see some crazy French Canadian standing up and just screaming, shouting, uh, singing his heart away on that song, right here, it's Sensei right here. <laughs> yeah, I saw all of those frowns uh, every day game I went to. Who's he? Who's that guy? <laughs> I'm just that enthusiastic. Uh, I think it makes for my charm a bit, just a bit. Uh, thank you again, Patrick, for this amazing, again, conversation. I uh, really, really thoroughly enjoyed it. Just a natural beat. Uh, awesome, terrific uh, a guy to, to speak uh, with. Don't forget his book, Fear is Fuel, available now on the Amazons through the link in uh, my description or show notes. But for now, let's revisit what we've learned from uh, Patrick today. So advice number one on how to overcome your fears and live a more fulfilling life. Scare yourself every day. On that one, what I really like is all the science that Patrick got prior to writing his book, all the neuroscientists, the psychologists, the professionals that he uh, interviewed and uh, discussed with, and it's 100% true, the science back uh, this 100%. You have to expose yourself uh, more often than possible to your own fear triggers um, in a way, in a more neuroscientific way, if you will, that will desensitize your brain reaction. So uh, I'm not saying you won't feel the fear anymore. Maybe you will, but on a much, much smaller scale to a point where it's not controlling your emotions or your uh, behavior. Number two, detach yourself emotionally. Meditation is one of the things. Uh, I think working on yourself is also a huge uh, on that second piece of advice because again, that's something that is trainable. That's not a uh, quote unquote gut given gift or a natural ability. You might have a natural ability to better control your emotions. That might be uh, perfectly true, but it's not something that's fatalistic. That's something you can train at home. Try to put yourself in difficult situations, situations that you might have found fearful maybe a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, like step by step, I'm afraid of heights. So instead of going bungee jumping this weekend, maybe I'm gonna, I'm gonna climb 
three steps of a ladder. How about that? Three steps of a ladder. Next week, I'm going to try six steps. The week after that, I'm going to my gym. There's a climbing rope. I'm going to try to climb the rope till I get to 10 feet high. And then when I like step by step, maybe in six months or a year, maybe I'll be ready then to uh, just experience the full awesomeness of a bungee jump. So detach yourself emotionally, try to control these emotions. It's just something your brain is telling you. It's a message. Emotions are a message from your brain. Finally, number three, decide on opportunity. I, I know I repeat myself, but sometimes in some interviews, like the, the pieces of advice that we get are so spot on. And today with Patrick is a prime example of that. So decide uh, your choices should be um, based on positivity, meaning it's the do or do not reflex. So fear-based decisions are usually do nots and opportunity-based decisions are do's. You want to start a business, your dream of yours, your, your, let, let's, let's go back again. Let's retract and rewind. Whoa. Maybe you're feeling bored <laughs> right now at your job listening to this podcast. There's a reason for that. Maybe your dream is to open an ice cream parlor, uh, a gym like I did three years ago. It's a dream. You feel good. You, you, you immerse yourself in these images and that uh, imaginary like reality, you feel good about yourself, you see look, your client smiling, you see yourself being happy, but there's always a but. The but is, what am I going to risk? Will it work? Uh, will I forfeit my all my income? Will I risk bankruptcy? Will I end up sleeping on a bench in some park in Santa Monica? Seems way too personal the way I said it. <laughs> It's not like I dreamt it. <laughs> but all of these questions, all these negative thoughts, my friend, I'm telling you, will always, backtrack again, rewind, will always be there. There is none, none, as in big fat zero, worthwhile decisions or worth, uh, worthwhile life moves that's zero risk, risks and 100% benefits. It's not, it's not possible. It just does not exist. And the phrase with bit, big risks come big rewards it is absolutely true. Uh, take it from Patrick, who is an uh, extraordinary entrepreneur. Take it from me, who is a just, just above average <laughs> entrepreneur, just above. <laughs> Since I've been 17 years old, I've done just okay. <laughs> Nothing worthwhile comes without risk. But if you focus on what you might lose, and again, that's bouncing back our ninth episode last week with Dominic Cruz, uh, UFC champion. He said exactly the same thing when he's going inside the octagon, defending a championship, is not focusing on what he might lose. For him, he's not a champion. He's, he's going in there to win something new. He's going in there to win his championship belt again. If you focus on the positive outcome, you're gonna be on the, in a much better place to make the right decision for you and not feeling influenced by the fears that surround you. Now it's your turn to tell me a story. I wanna know in the comments on my social media at Sensei Says Pod or my personal Twitter at Sensei Pascal. How are you dealing with your fears? Do you have any strategies in place? Do you have a plan in mind? Please leave it in the comments uh, to inspire uh, other cyclos watching this uh, on the YouTubes or listening on the uh, audio podcast machines all around the world. Always a pleasure to read what you have to say. Now, if you've enjoyed what you've heard or uh, watched today, please like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the podcast on whichever platform you are listening on, share it to a friend. You know a friend who's afraid of everything in his life or her life? Please share her or him the podcast, share the help, share the love, share the support. Don't forget to leave 
leave a review to this podcast. Also, if you want to get the episodes fast and first, don't forget to sign up to the newsletter. There's always plenty of advice, self-improvement, life-changing advice to learn from our archive, so go nuts. And on that note, Saito, us, I will see you next week. You are dismissed. People wake up in deficit, and it's by design. You don't need anything, your eyes, your eyes opened. Clearly, you're in surplus at this point. You have more than you need because there's extra oxygen out there, right? <laughs> there's a thing called the progress principle. I mean, through historic history, through data, through whatever, that we as human beings achieve happiness through progress towards mm -hmm. a goal.